let me do that again. Good morning. All right, good to see everyone this morning. We are jumping into a series, two weeks. We're going to talk about marriage this, this Sunday and next Sunday. We're going to talk about relationships and just the, the significance of those relationships in our lives and how we can make them better. Because I don't know about you, I would love for every one of my relationships to be better. I'd love for every one of my um, my connections with someone to be better, and this fits into our understanding of what it means to connect with God, to connect with each other, and to connect with our community around us. And I, I know that's as our as our vision for this year is connecting. One of the things we started talking about was how we can connect to each other and one of the important relationship connections that we can make is in the context of marriage so we want to talk about that and so I want to dive into this aspect of of relationship and marriage that we all need in your life uh, our lives and and it's good information whether you've been married for a hundred years probably not or you've been married for a week which I know at least one couple in the room that's true And so uh, we're going to look at what it takes to sustain a a positive and beautiful relationship with that person that you've decided to spend the rest of your life with. And And I say intend to spend the rest of your life with because no one goes into marriage. I've never met a couple. I've never done premarital counseling with the over 300 persons that I've been involved in their marriages with. I've never sat down and talked with somebody who said, well, I'm going into this with every intention of not staying married. I've never had that happen. I've never met anybody who went into marriage thinking, you know, this is going to end in divorce. I know it is, but, you know, why not, right? I mean... What else should I do? And so no one goes into marriage thinking it's going to end poorly. And so most of us go into marriage thinking we're going to spend the rest of my life with this person. And so how do we do that, right? How do we spend the rest of our lives with somebody? And I want to unpack uh, what the Bible says for us and help us understand how God plans for men and women caring for each other in marriage to care deeply and emotionally and passionately for each other in marriage so that we could live happier, happily ever after, uh, maybe, right? But li- maybe not happily ever after, but live in such a way that we carry out what God wants for us in our marriages, which is to be, to be an earthly representation of God's life in our lives. I mean, marriage is this really important representation. Uh, Scripture uh, throughout the Bible from beginning to end talks about how marriage is a representation of our connection with God and God's connection with us, and especially God's connection to the church. Uh, We're often called the bride of Christ, right? And he is the groom. There are lots of passages in that respect, but I'm gonna turn to one in Ephesians chapter five. Because here's what I believe. God wants our marriages, God wants our marriages to be a representation of who he is. That's our first teaching note this morning. That's an important foundational piece. God wants our marriages to be a representation of who he is in our lives and in the world. And so if we're going to do that, how do, we do, how do we be a representation of who God is to one another, to each other in the context of marriage, but also how do we do that to, for the world around us to be a representation of who God is? And so let's take a look at Ephesians chapter five. Now this is a passage that a lot of people veer away from on Sunday mornings because it uses a word that some of us don't really like all that well. And the word is submit. And this passage particularly has been twisted and, and utilized to do things that it was never meant to do to people who have not been able to hear it differently since then. And and here's what I mean by that. uh, What people have done is that they've said, well, here's what submission looks like, and therefore you shall. And so people have used it as a tool, used it as a club, biblically. And that's not what was intended in this passage whatsoever. I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's what the, uh, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing, speaking God's word to us, that 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 was the intention whatsoever, that submission was this idea of you will do what I tell you to do, and that especially at time periods in history, it was used as men rule over women and women submit to men. That's not how this is supposed to work. 
And so let me help you understand one of the things that, that are, is important as we walk into this, and that is that we are supposed to submit to one another, and that's the very first verse that I'm going to read. Verse 21 in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let me, let me help you understand, let me help all of us get on the same page, and that is this. It, it says that Christ submitted to the Father, that Jesus Christ, part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and therefore came to earth and gave his life for us. It's the same submission understanding that we have that Jesus was willing to submit to the Father even though they were equals. Ah. You see, men, the, the, the imagery comes over then into our marriage relationships that we are equals submitting to one another. It is not a situation where one is better than the other, one is higher than the other, one is more respected than the other. It is that as men and women we are equals and therefore we should submit to one another equally as Christ submitted to the Father. Does that make sense? Give me a, like an amen, Dave. Like, yeah, okay, good. All right. Now that's deep and theological, right? That's, that's like intense. What do you mean Jesus submitted to the Father? Well, yeah. See, the understanding from the very beginning is that, is that God would save us, that we are saved by God. And the process was that the Son of God would come to earth, that Jesus, that God would come to earth in a human form and give his life for us so that we could have eternal life. And in the submission of Christ to the Father, to the Godhead, he, he gave his life for us. And then he calls us to give our lives to one another. And in the marriage relationship, now that's in general, right? He calls us to give our lives to one another in general. But he, in the marriage relationship, it's unique because it's this equal submission to one another. There's this equality of submission. And he wants us to understand that very clearly in this first verse. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it goes on to say, in specific, it goes on to say, here's how that looks, right? In verse 22, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is this, that doesn't remove the equality, okay? Nowhere in here is the equality uh, is removed, for the husband is the head of the wife, is the head, Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. The church is important and significant. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. You can hear how possibly this passage could have been misused, right? And it was. I, I, I don't mean to apologize for things done in the past but I'm going to apologize for things done in the past <laughs> because some people used this passage wrongly because they thought it, it was saying something but here's I'm going to go on to read I want to read some more because it says what husbands should do for husbands this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean washed by the cleansing of God's word he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is, it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to take a moment this morning, and I'm going to ask a question of every person in the room and every person watching online and listening to this if you're, as you're out taking a walk, because we know some people kind of hit play, and then they go for a walk with their earbuds in, and they listen, and 
So we know that, so anybody listening, watching, if you're here today, the question is one I believe we all need to be asking, because we tend to ask a lot of questions about marriage, but I'm not sure we're always asking the right questions. And and as a teaching team here at Cross Point Church, we started looking at, at the calendar of things and started talking about this, this idea of how are we deepening our ability to connect to one another and to connect to God. And we said, we've got to do, we've got to, we, we got excited about this opportunity of doing a marriage series. We've got to do a marriage series because here's the thing. We were hearing, as a church staff, we were hearing a lot of things about marriage. And, and so many of them were just challenging. We were hearing a lot of things about relationships, and so many of them were just challenging to us because we knew that people were asking some of the wrong questions about their relationships and about marriage. And we knew we needed a marriage series because we had heard so many difficult and challenging situations coming out of marriages and out of relationships. And as pastors and church leaders, we hear a lot of positive things, but we also hear a lot of negative things. And we get to hear some things that are kind of distressing. And we, ha- and, and we get to walk through some really challenging things in people's lives, including challenging aspects of marriage. And so let me tell you, just, I, I just need to say this to you. One of the things we could do right now is to, is to dive into all of our relationships at a deeper level, especially our marriage relationships. Because if we don't, you will eventually sit in, in my office talking to me about your marriage. And I don't want that to happen. And so um, I, I want us to understand that marriage is something that God has intended to be a wonderful thing. It's not, a, not supposed to be an uphill climb every day. It's not supposed to be like you're pushing the boulder uphill every day. It's, it's a not supposed to generate more stress than we can handle. Marriage is not sup, supposed to be some punishment. It's not a ball and chain. It's not what marriage was supposed to be. Marriage is a side-by-side journey that faces the ups and downs of life. This is your next teaching note. A side-by-side journey that faces the ups and downs of life with a person by your side who will uplifts and supports you as if Jesus were walking with you. That's the idea. That you have someone beside you striving to represent Christ as best as he or she possibly can so that you can experience the fullness of Christ in your lives. One doing that for the other. Don't hear me the wrong way, by the way. Your spouse is not Jesus, right? I didn't have to tell you that, right? Our spouse isn't Jesus. We are representatives. We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus for another person in a unique way. Marriage allows us to do that in a unique way, in a way that no one else is allowed. And so whether you've been, you're married right now or whether you're not married right now, whether you've been married or not, or you're looking to get married or, or not, we all need to hear that what we often see represented as marriage in society that we live in, as long, all the things that we see represented in families and, and, and in friendship circles, a lot of times it's the version of marriage that has been twisted by our sin twisted by an enemy who would bombard us with negative things about life and about the possibilities of marriage and about God's word for us. And and Satan would love nothing more than to destroy every marriage he possibly can because the ripple effect of a destroyed marriage is devastation. It just hits everyone hard. And Satan loves nothing more than to break up a couple. I've learned that over the years. So what's the question I want to ask you? Remember I said I want to ask everybody a question. Here's the question I want to ask. What if, what if every marriage, every Christian marriage, could be one where the presence of this reciprocal care of each other, that Ephesians chapter 5 talks about this loving, caring submission to one another. What if every Christian marriage had the presence of this reciprocal care that we're supposed to provide to each other? What if we had that? What would the world look like if Christians could represent this submissive, reciprocal marriage covenant with each other what would the world 
look like? Now, you may have thought I was going to ask you, is that something you want for your life? I don't think I have to ask that question, right? I think we all want something positive in our relationships, no matter what those relationships look like, especially the marriage relationship. We want something that's going to uplift us, encourage us, something that's positive every single day. What would it look like if the world could see people living out Ephesians chapter 5? Here's here's what I, I believe. I believe it's possible. I would argue that God would not have put it in Scripture if it were not possible. So God believes it's possible for us to live out a godly marriage. God believes that that's something we can do and that we can live it out in such a way as God intended to be truly sacrificial to each other, truly giving to each other, truly submitting to one another in a way that lifts up not just the other person, but lifts up Christ in our midst, in our marriages. What does that look like, right? So here's what I know. It's obviously not happening. Or I wouldn't need to be doing a marriage series. We would be like, hey, we're all good with marriage, let's move on. Well, we know that's probably not true, right? We could all use a little bit more encouragement, a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more wisdom, a little bit more information about how to have a great relationship and how to have a fantastic marriage. And this, the, the reality is there's a significant amount of hurt and heartache coming from marriages today. And while the divorce rate is down a few ticks, we are nowhere near out of the woods and living in a land where marriages are winning all the time. So what do we do about this? We can go back to this passage in Ephesians chapter five, and we're gonna, Julie and I are gonna dive into this passage even deeper tonight in in this study at 6.30. And and Pastor Matt said we're in the conference room down the hallway. Um, One of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna do an audible if needed, and we we may move over to this room if we get a big enough crowd. Because I'm hoping everybody shows up. Because I think we all need this. Here's the toughest part, getting the guys here. I'm just going to drop that out there, right? I'm just going to, guys, you know, we don't do this well. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Find out how we can have a good marriage, sweetheart. Come home and tell me all about it, right? Uh, try to get the guys here. If you're online and, and you're watching this right now and you're thinking, oh, that's nice. We're not going to live cast this. Um, we just want you, we want you in the room. It's not just for couples. This is for anybody and everybody. To, because we all need a, a foundational groundwork on what good relationships and a good marriage looks like. And we need to be encouraging that with each other. And if we don't know what it looks like or what it should look like, godly, biblically, then how can we encourage somebody else in doing this? So this is for everyone to hear. And, and we're going to dive into Ephesians chapter 5 because I believe... That God wants us to hear this passage and live this out in such a way so that we could have powerful, soul-nurturing marriages where both persons, not just one or the other, gets uplifted or encouraged, but both people are submitting to one another and encouraging one another and lifting each other up, striving so that we we could be more like Jesus. I mean, my goal in, in my marriage is to not put my wife in a situation where she doesn't look like Jesus, right? I mean, that's my goal, to set her up in a situation where she can live out a life that represents Christ and that she can do that for me as well. And the, the last thing I want to do is undermine her relationship with Jesus. I actually want to do things in my life that give her an opportunity to be more like Jesus, right? And, and, and because well, here's what can happen. If we're not cautious, we get into situations where where we think marriage is all about one person wins and the other person loses. One person gains, one person gives. One person has everything, one person has nothing. And and sometimes that goes back and forth. You ever been on one of those, you know, playground teeter-totters, right? 
Sometimes it goes back and forth, and, and we think, well, okay, that's good. You won last time. I get to win this time. You got to watch what you wanted to watch last night. I get to watch what I want to watch tonight. And so somebody wins, somebody loses, right? And, and so we've kind of boiled the, our relationships and our marriages down to this idea of somebody wins, somebody loses. And the reality is my win, here's your next teaching, my win should always be our win, and our win should always be my win. My win should always be our win, and our wins should always be mine. I should own all of our opportunities to win. So if, if my wife wants to go to a play and she wants me to go along, that's a win. I may not enjoy plays, right? It depends on the play. I've been to a couple that I didn't enjoy, like Cats, on Broadway, it was all right. It wasn't the one I, you know, necessarily, anyway, right? I mean, but you know what? It was a win because I got to spend time with my wife. I don't care if we're doing something I don't like to do if I'm spending time with her. That's my win, right? Does that make sense? Right. And I'm not saying it will always be something you're going to enjoy, but it's the ability to see the win in the situation as being able to spend time with this other person who you love. And that's God's directive for us in all of our relationships and especially deeply, profoundly in the marriage relationship. When the other person wins, we win. We win. And, and, and not that marriage is all about winning, Right? I mean, I want winning marriages. I really do. And I want my marriage to have winning moments, right? I, I want that. But the reality is most of our marriages, we, we feel like we're just kind of, well, it's not a win. It's not a loss. It's just, can we just break even, right? Can we just, can we just keep our heads above water, right? Some days are just like, ah, you know, ships in the night. You know, we're packing lunches in the morning and out the door. That's after, you know, we got the kids out the door or off to the bus or whatever it might be. It's crazy, right? But look at verse 21 again with me. Submit to one, another's, one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the kickoff statement. A great marriage, and, and all of our relationships, but a great marriage is built on this God-given plan of mutual submission. That we're supposed to be submitting to each other so that we're living out a passage like 1 Corinthians 13 that talks about what love is. Love is kind, love is generous, love is grace-filled. It's not hateful, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13 kind of reminds us that love has these parameters we can do that if we're willing to submit to one another. Or, or Romans chapter 12, verse 3, that says we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves than we ought. You see, part of the problem is we go into marriage thinking, what can I get out of this? Because this is about me, right? My marriage is about me. No, not according to, Rome, not according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. My marriage and my, my deepest relationships are about how I can submit to the, it's about the other person. My marriage relationship, at its best, is not about me. It's about the other person. Here's the wonderful thing. If the other person believes the same thing, then their goal is for their marriage to be all about you. And so you don't have to worry about you. The other person's got that covered. Your job is to worry about them. It's to do everything you can to care about that other person. That's the goal of a godly marriage for us. That's the goal that God lays out for us. And you see, you see it in a, in a selfish, self-seeking, hedonistic society that says, what can I get out of this relationship? With the understanding that if I don't get that anymore, it's okay to leave? That's not godly. Because that's, uh, we, I, I, in looking at all the statistics and looking at our society, it feels like marriage has become something that I can get my needs met. And if that doesn't happen anymore, it's okay for me to leave and go find where I can get my needs met. And the enemy would love nothing more for us to think that marriage is all about this kind of give and take proposition where you get your needs met all the time. And that's, not marriage, according to God's desire for us. 
that that's not your goal going into marriage. If, if your goal going into marriage is to find somebody who will meet all your needs, good luck. Gosh, don't come to me to do your wedding, though. I'm going to say no. Because that is a road toward destruction. To try to find somebody else who will meet all your needs. Have, you, have anybody ever met somebody like that? I got a person in my life who meets all my needs. Anybody? No. There's, there might be one person online who says, maybe right? But I doubt it. I mean, let's, I, I, realistically, there's not a single person out there that can meet all my needs. There is a God who can meet all my needs. And if my relationship with God is in place, then I can be in a relationship with somebody else. Because God's already met all my needs. I'm not asking somebody else to do that for me. God does that for me. If somebody comes to me and says, this person makes me complete, I'm like, oh God, this person completes me. I, that, I know like, like that's a, a wonderful statement from a Hallmark movie. This person completes me, right? It's a great statement. This person makes me whole. No. You see, that's God's job. God's job is to make us complete and whole so that we can then offer a complete and whole person to someone else instead of asking someone else to try to make us complete and whole. I don't know about you, I get messy. And to have somebody else try to make me complete and whole, that's a full, that would be a full-time job. Anybody with me? It would be a full-time job to try to make me complete and whole. I mean, that's, that's unrealistic. Now, I can ask God to do that because that's what God does, right? God's desire is to make me complete and whole in Jesus Christ. And so, as the Apostle Paul's writing 2,000 years ago, this, 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 which still applies today to us, he's sketching out what submission looks like, what this looks like. Once I have my relationship with Jesus, then I can offer a whole and complete person to someone else who in turn is striving to offer a whole and complete person back to me. It should like, look like two people who, who are, are striving to put the other person first. And so, so things like, like a full and complete submission to one another looks like you might be giving everything up, but in fact what you're doing is you're gaining everything by, by surrendering and submitting. It, it, think of it this way. If you took everything you had and handed it to somebody else, and the only way you're going to keep it is if you hand it to somebody else. The only, somebody says to you, the only way you can keep everything you own is if you give it to somebody else. And then when you give it to that other person, that person gives it back to you and says, thank you for surrendering everything you have to me. I'm going to give it back to you so that you can enjoy it. You see, there's this reciprocal understanding in our relationships that challenge us to submit fully to the other person. And if we do that together, if we do that together, if we're willing to fully submit so fully to the other that, our, that life is no longer about us, we, see two, we can see two people in a relationship and in a marriage who are willing to bend over backwards for each other. In, in guy terms, here's what this looks like. I'd take a bullet for you. In gal terms, this is, here's what this looks like. I'd watch a game with you. Okay, this was getting really serious and I needed a little laughter, so that was good, right? Although some of you are like, yeah, that's so true. I would like, no, have no desire to watch the game. But I'll sit down and watch the game with you, right? Fine, thank you, okay. It is this willingness to say, my life for yours. And if two people are doing that with each other in a full submission, that's what Jesus says, that's what marriage and relationships are supposed to look like, my life for yours. That it's not about me. Romans chapter 12, 3, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. You see, we, we go into marriage thinking, you know, I deserve all of this. 
I deserve everything you give me. And the reality is that we're supposed to look at the other person as the one who deserves everything I can give. Everything I can give. Because if Jesus was willing to die for that other person, then that other person deserves everything I can give. I mean, this is the most profound relationship we will ever have, just shy of our relationship with Jesus. And it's the one that we should invest the most into. So what if, what if it were possible for two people to be so loving, so caring, so submissive, so generous, so willing to give up everything for each other? What would that look like? And would you want that? I do. I want that. I want a relationship that's so loving, so caring, so submissive, so generous, so willing to give everything up for each other. I want that for my life. Here's what I want to tell you. I have to want it strongly and desperately every single day because here's what I know about myself. I'm human and I'm, I fail at wanting that because some days I just want what I want. Can I just have what I want, right? I mean, if I'm, he, if I'm completely transparent and honest with you, there are some days when what I want feels more important than what she wants in my mind. And I have to work on that. That's a daily thing. I, w this year we'll be married 42 years. I'm still working on this. Some of you have been married longer than that. You're still working on it, right? It's, it's a lifelong thing for us to be willing to submit to the other person, to willing to give everything to the other person, knowing full well that you've put them in trustworthy hands and that it will all come back. I, I, have, I have stepped into a place where I'm trusting another person with my life. And if we're willing to allow God to come into that relationship, as, a, as Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that when two join their lives together, that God weaves his life in the middle of their lives and that that becomes a cord of three strands not easily broken. Two strands can unravel. Three is not easily broken. And, and so the two of us, when we, when we strive to be godly and then God comes in the middle of that, we begin to have the strength in marriage that we need to endure. And if we're willing to allow God to come in, I believe some incredible things can happen. But it's going to take an I give mentality. You remember that? I, I, I grew up with two brothers. So we did a lot of wrestling. We did a lot of a horse play, right? And, and when, when you would get put into a position where you were unable to get back out you would say I give right and the other person's job was to let go then because they had won the day they had won the game they had won the wrestling match and I give you know you'd pound on the floor I give right what if our marriages were filled with two people who constantly look at the other person and say I give I give it's not about me it's about you I give I surrender. Open hands, I give. What if that were the case? I mean, Philippians chapter 2, 3 through 5 says this. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ had. That's our marriages. That's our relationships. That's the deepest relationship we have should look like that. That we're giving everything away to a person who you've deemed to be the one you will walk through life with for the rest of your life. And no one, no one should ever take that place. No one should ever be able to step into that and try to do that for you. You should be outdoing everybody else. And no one should ever be able to reach that level. No one should ever step in between the two of you and say, I can do that better. No one should ever be able to do that. And if we keep this passage, 
If we keep Ephesians chapter 5 in mind and how we should equally submit to one another, we can have marriages, last teaching note, you ready for this? We can have marriages that are not only good, but are places of blessings, places of hope, places where trust is rich, places where there is more great moments than rough patches, patches, and places where love wins and the devil loses. That's what I want for our marriages and for every one of our relationships. That's what I want. But more than that, it's what God wants for every one of our marriages and every one of our relationships. That the, the devil loses and God wins. And so what Jesus did is he said to his disciples, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something so that I can be present in your lives because this world is going to try to tear you apart and the enemy will try to destroy you. And he will try to destroy and, and tear apart every relationship you have and, and everything that you've trusted and everything you believe in. He will try his best. But do me a favor, don't forget me. Don't forget me when the world starts getting difficult. Don't forget me when the world starts getting tough. Don't forget me in the middle of your relationships and in the middle of your marriage. I am there in your home with you. I am there in the covenant with you. I am there in the joining together of your lives together. I will pull you together if you're willing. Don't forget me. Don't forget to call on me. Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to seek my face in your marriage and in your lives together. And so he said to his disciples, I'm going to make sure you don't forget me, but I'm going to give you a way to do that. So today, on this first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion. If you're home, if you're at home with us, this is your chance to run to the kitchen. Ah! Right? Go to the kitchen. You can find something that you can use for communion today there at home. I encourage you to do that. Because this is Jesus' way of saying to us, look, remember me in all that you do, in every aspect of your life, in every relationship you have. Make sure I'm involved. Make sure I'm a part of your marriage. Make sure I'm a part of how you love one another. Make sure you remember me. And then he said to his disciples, look, it's going to get, it's going to get brutal over the next couple of days. Remember, this is the Last Supper, Right? He's, he's gathered his disciples together in Jerusalem. They're in what's called the upper room. I've been to the place where they think is the upper room. Julie and I are going back in 2025. We're going back to Israel. We're going to do another tour if you want to go with us. Just one of the amazing places is to stand in the upper room and recognize and realize that in this room, Jesus broke bread with his disciples and handed them the cup that you will receive today. And while he was there with his disciples, he said, I'm going I'm to I'm give you some bread, and I want you to take and eat this, and this bread is going to be the representation of my body so that you will never forget me. Every time you take this bread and eat it, remember me. And I'm going to give you the cup, and it's going to represent my blood shed for you, and every time you drink from this cup, I want you to remember me. So I want to pray over our elements, and I'm going to invite you to come forward and receive these elements of bread and juice. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of this table. We thank you for the way that you laid out how we can remember you. Through these elements of bread and juice, Lord, help us to remember your body and blood so that we can be more like you, people who are willing to submit their very lives to another like you gave your life for us your desire Lord is that we would be willing to be more like you and that means willing to give everything we have for another help us to learn how to do that Lord help us to receive these gifts in such a way that we can be encouraged to give our lives like you gave yours. Fill these gifts, Lord, with your spirit and fill us, your people, with your presence so that we might be your people, redeemed by your blood, encouraged by your body, to, so that we might go into the world being your body for those who need to see you, your blood for those who need to know you. 
and the salvation you bring. Bless these elements, Lord, and bless each one of us who receive them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching Crosspoint Online this week. We hope that you enjoyed that message and got something out of it. Before we let you go, we do want to give you the opportunity to be part of the community here at Crosspoint Church through giving. Your giving helps do all of the different ministries we're involved in with kids and with young adults and teenagers and families in the community, work we do around the world in Sierra Leone and other places, and you can be a part of that by giving through Crosspoint Church. You can go to the link that is right in the description of this video, go online and give there. You can click this QR code that's at the bottom of the screen. It'll take you right to that page. We appreciate everybody who wants to be a part of the giving that helps the ministries of Crosspoint Church happen. Thanks, and we will see you next time.